from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. The race to plant in the South. So we've had a lot of people call about how do I plant rice that have never planted rice before. Why rice is all the rage right now in Louisiana. How pregnancy checks on livestock landed two men in jail. Plus, we continue to follow a developing story, EPA's big announcement regarding E15. We're committed to E15. We're committed to advanced biofuels. What ethanol leaders would like to see happen next, right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when experience meets expertise. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. E15 will be available nationwide to drivers this summer. The EPA making the announcement on Friday saying the decision to issue an emergency fuel waiver for E15 will provide communities relief at the pump. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins me. Michelle, the Renewable Fuels Association is happy to see this, but say it's just a temporary solution. Yeah, Clinton, EPA has taken similar action the past two summers, granting a 20-day waiver and then repeatedly extending it through September 15th. Now, the emergency waivers will go into effect on May 1st, allowing E15 to be sold from terminals, and then on June 1st, retail stations will be able to sell it to the public. The Clean Air Act allows the EPA administrator to temporarily waive certain fuel requirements to address shortages. Administrator Regan told me that's the same process he's used to grant emergency waivers for E15 the last two years. This administration, as the secretary said, we're committed to E15. We're committed to advanced biofuels. Uh, we're committed to um, all of these things that are encouraging and helping our economy grow. And so I'm very cognizant um, that sometimes these what might seem to be last minute decisions are disruptive and don't allow for as much plan as possible. But uh, that is the process that we have at the moment. And if you look at the previous two years, I think we've delivered. Administrator Reagan determined that with the ongoing market supply issues created by geopolitical conflicts in the Black Sea and Middle East, it was in the public's best interest to allow summertime E15 sales. The ethanol industry applauds that. There's a lot of tension, a lot of uncertainty in the global uh, energy marketplace right now and the administrator recognized that he recognized the impact that that could have on fuel supplies and prices here in the U.S. this summer. Approximately two-thirds of the country is not allowed to sell E15 in the summer so Cooper says the action will result in a great savings for consumers at a time gas prices tend to be highest. Yeah we're seeing E15 uh, about 25 cents per gallon less than regular gasoline on average in the marketplace today. Some places you're seeing a, a larger discount than that. Some places you're seeing a little less. Cooper says, however, the waivers are granted for 20 days and then have to be reissued. So this is just a stopgap solution. We still need a permanent resolution to this problem and permanent removal of that barrier. Uh, we need to get out of this cycle of you know, having to wait uh, until April of every year and then hoping that the administration grants an emergency waiver. Uh, that's why we continue to work with Congress uh, to get legislation across the goal line that would permanently remove this barrier. Cooper says the odds of passing a bill to allow nationwide year-round E15 sales are good, with the petroleum industry supporting it as they don't want a patchwork of rules next summer when EPA allows summertime E15 in eight states. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Another announcement we've been waiting for from EPA has to do with how corn-based ethanol could qualify for sustainable aviation fuel credits. Farm Journal Washington analyst Jim Wiesmeyer says EPA Administrator Michael Regan is scheduled to testify on the 2025 budget for the agency before a House Appropriations Subcommittee at the end of the month. Now he says that has sparked speculation that it could lead to an announcement regarding the updated Greenhouse Gases Regulated Emissions and Energy Use in Technologies or GREET model. It measures emissions from ag practices used by farmers producing biofuel feedstocks. It's key for the biofuels industry for measuring ethanol emissions to see whether the fuel qualifies for an SAF fuel tax credit. 
Now, it was thought the updated model would be released at the start of last month, but that didn't happen. Regan and USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack indicated the update would be revealed soon. Is it time to develop a vaccine for H5N1 avian influenza? That's a question USDA is asking as it monitors an outbreak of the virus hitting dairy cattle. USDA says it's evaluating the possibility of developing a vaccine in order to protect cattle herds from H5N1. While it's believed to have originated in wild migratory birds last month, it was found in dairy cattle now in eight different states and in one Texas dairy worker. APHIS is currently assessing the development of a vaccine for cattle and says manufacturers have shown interest, adding that developing and deploying that vaccine for poultry is more difficult. Health officials are also trying to understand exactly how the virus is being transmitted in cattle. Currently, it believes some of it is happening via mechanical means, possibly via milking equipment. A warm weekend in the south while temperatures were below normal across the Great Plains and Midwest. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joins us with a look ahead to this week. Yeah, as we go through the next couple of days, we're still not quite done with that wintry precipitation called I have to say snow that and in the forecast coming up for Tuesday and Wednesday. Another low pressure system is going to be working across the United States. Uh, the moisture is going to be out there, but it's not going to be as robust as if we had some Gulf moisture working and surging from the south to the north. The lift is in the atmosphere. There is some moisture, so we'll start to see some rain. This is Tuesday at 11 a.m right along uh, an initial boundary that's going to move off to the east coast wrap around moisture is where we could see some of that snow and that's going to be back in the northern part of the midwest again snow is going to be a very low chance but it is in the forecast for your wednesday morning wednesday afternoon for a few areas across the united states it's actually going to be uh, the first of a few troughs that come in and across the United States, so expect it to be kind of a wet week. Uh, severe weather threat isn't all that high, but it is something that we can't ignore. That's Wednesday at about 1 p.m. We'll talk about that next system uh, coming up in just a little bit. Preg checking large animals has apparently landed two Pennsylvania men in jail after they were accused of practicing veterinary medicine without a license. A 2020 complaint filed by Pennsylvania alleges the men and employees at No Bull Solutions performed ultrasounds on large animals and were making diagnosis. The state says they were both fined and ordered to stop, but now the state says they continued to do it without a license. The picture you are seeing are from the complaint filed by the state. LancasterFarming.com reports a spokesman for the company says the owners were advised not to pay fines or appear in court because they don't see an issue with using an ultrasound saying pregnancy isn't a disease. Now it says several dairy farmers in the area depend on the company, but the spokesman says both men are now serving 30 day sentences without bail. Going on to say if the State Board of Veterinary Medicine is going to interpret performing ultrasounds as practicing medicine, the law needs to be changed. Laws regarding who can perform ultrasounds of large animals differ from state to state. One billion dollars in emergency food assistance is on its way to nations with people in desperate need of food. USDA and the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, announcing the joint effort. Now, the funding will be used by U.S. grown food for 18 countries, including Bangladesh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Haiti, Kenya, Rwanda, and the Sudan. An initial tranche of about $950 million will support the purchase, shipment, and distribution of several things, including wheat, rice, sorghum, lentils, vegetable oil, cornmeal, and kidney beans. Additionally, a separate pilot project worth $50 million will be established to utilize U.S. commodities not traditionally included in international food assistance programs. The effort is being funded with money from the Commodity Credit Corporation. A solid rally to end the week in grains and lean hogs climb back above the $100 mark. We'll have details next. And later, rice planters are rolling in Louisiana. We check in on crop progress down south in the country. Several key grain elevators are changing hands. CHS says it has signed an intent to purchase agreement for eight grain facilities in five states from Cargill. Those include locations in Pipestone and Maynard, Minnesota, Morris and Seneca, Illinois, 
Holdridge, Nebraska, Cheyenne Wells, and Byers, Colorado, and Parker, South Dakota. CHS says the locations are part of their larger strategy to invest in supply chains so it can officially connect with the global marketplace. Now, Cargill calls CHS the right partner for the sale. The purchase scheduled to close in early June of this year. A higher minimum wage for fast food workers in California appears to be translating into higher food prices. It comes after the state raised wages for many fast food workers to $20 an hour. Kalinowski Equity Research says Wendy's is leading the way with price hikes at 8%. Starbucks prices are up 7%. Taco Bell, 3%, while prices at Burger King are up 2%. Outside fundamentals and export sales helping grains in the week in the green. Michelle Rook has more in Markets Now. Great, all closing to the plus side on Friday. Rich Nelson with Allendale is back with us. And Rich, uh, let's talk about some of the things that might have pushed the market up on Friday, first of all. You know, were we putting a little premium in because of the geopolitical conflict that we're seeing in the Middle East? We could argue some of that here. Now, keep in mind for the week as a whole, we're still going to end lower here for this corn market. But like you mentioned, a little little better cha uh, a change of expectations here for the Friday discussion. You can argue some uh, outside market issues, like you mentioned, maybe a little rain delay here for next week's planting. Uh, keep in mind, next week is historically the number four planting week in history. So maybe a small disruption there, adding a small piece of premium for uh, for this ending week trade here. Yeah. And what about just technically we went down, got very close to some support levels in soybeans or at least the contract low. So was some of it technical or some short covering? And you got to say something like that here. Maybe not too much on the corn side here, but maybe for soybeans, like you, like you mentioned here. We came within six cents of those prior major contract lows. So maybe some of the uh, chart-based issues, you can argue a small piece of support there. And keep in mind, we are still looking at a summer forecast. Not right now, but a summer forecast, which does still add a light amount of threat here for the yield discussion. No doubt. But that should also maybe put a little bit of a risk premium back into the wheat market, too, shouldn't it? The two-week forecast is still generally beneficial for moisture for both hard and soft red. So for now, a light amount of concern, but overall, looks like a good spring rain for this uh, winter wheat crop. To talk to Rich Nelson one-on-one, -on -one, call 800-262-7538. Watch Markets Now with Michelle Rook on the Farm Journal YouTube channel, keeping you updated throughout the day on the markets at the open midday and close. Find out what moved the markets today and what to expect the market to do next. As I mentioned earlier, we got a couple of troughs working across the United States, or another way to say that, a couple of storm systems working across the United States this week. This is a jet stream on Monday. The uh, first one of uh, this past weekend exits to the northeast, and here comes the second one, that bowling ball. Pretty shallow, so I'm not expecting widespread rain or even severe weather. As again, this is going to be pretty shallow, but it could bring about uh, some snow chances up here towards the uh, Canadian United States border as going to Tuesday and Wednesday. Ridge of high pressure develop, develops over the United States. Depending on the strength of this ridge, the next storm system will be on the West Coast on Wednesday, which means by Thursday and Friday, it's going to be working on to the coast. Again, this is coming up on Friday, timing this out to be next weekend working across the United States, Saturday and Sunday. As for that wind gust forecast, as we go through the next couple of days into your Monday and Tuesday, that next trough, so this is Monday early in the morning by Tuesday afternoon, start to see again that trough and that corresponding cold front with it. Keep in mind, right along that boundary where we have the strongest winds is also where we could see you know, some showers, perhaps even some thunderstorms. Being a weak low pressure system, there's also going to be some wind kicking up on the backside of that low. The next one's starting to take shape. This is Tuesday at 10 p.m. back out here towards the west. You now with again some stronger winds with the next system still offshore. Wednesday and Thursday, that storm system comes onto the west coast. Expect it to work across the United States by Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm kind of working with a, a seven to eight day period with these troughs and ridges in the jet stream as well. Otherwise, a precipitation forecast as you go through the rest of the week. We talked about this earlier with a shallow trough. Uh, you get some rain, not a lot to the north and then any kind of energy that kicks up to the south. That's where we may get some heavier snow showers. Rain showers.
Start off in Nebraska, partly cloudy with some wind, high around 75 degrees, low about 46. Mixville, Connecticut, sunny, high about 56 degrees. Mixville, South Carolina, partly cloudy, high of 67. Deals on sprayers. That's what Machinery Pete is focused on this week as he shares his lessons from auction next. And later, it's time to get rice planted in Louisiana. We'll check on spring progress in the country. An update on a big deal happening right now in ag machinery. Agco and Trimble announcing the completion of their joint venture. According to Forbes, Agco and Trimble are rolling out a new company to help farmers merge their fleets together from a precision equipment standpoint. The business will focus on technology including guidance, autonomy, precision spraying, connected farming, data management, and sustainability. Now the tools are meant to work across brands, models, and years. The new company will go by the brand PTX. Looking for a deal on a used sprayer? Well, Machine Repeat has a little history lesson for us this morning when it comes to prices. All right, folks, today let's talk self-propelled sprayers. And before we talk prices today, let's start with a little history lesson. So let's go back 20 years to the year 2004. Now back then, the highest auction price I saw all year in 2004 on a sprayer was 115,000 bucks. And it was on a sale March 24th in 2004 in Tyndall, South Dakota by Westby Auction Service and it was on a 2001 John Deere 4710 with $628 on it again, 115,000 bucks. Okay, let's zoom forward 10 years till the year 2014, so 10 years ago. Well, we just over doubled the highest auction sale price on a sprayer, got up to 250,000 bucks. And that sold on a very nice farm auction, December 17th, 2014 in Washington Court, also Ohio, by Schrader Real Estate and Auction. And the sprayer was a 2014 model John Deere R4030, only had 102 hours on it, again, 250,000 bucks. All right, now let's come up till today, early 2024, 10 years later. Well, the average here, the highest auction sale price on a sprayer has almost doubled again. I've actually seen the two highest ever on recent sales. So here's a picture of the record holder. This was February 27th, online dealer auction in London, Ohio, sale by Merritt Auctions, a 23 model. John Deere 612R with 23 hours on it went for 484,000 bucks. Three weeks after that, an online consignment auction in Hamilton, Illinois by Sullivan Auctioneers. This 22 model AE SDS12 with 549 hours on it went for 480,500 bucks. So we're almost doubling every 10 years here, highest auction price on a sprayer, folks. So what does that mean in 2034? If you want to buy the nicest sprayer at auction, it'll cost you about a million bucks. <laughs> we'll see. All right, thanks, Pete. Well, up next, spring spraying and spring planting go hand in hand. We'll take a look at rice planting in Louisiana next in the country. Happening right now, rice planting is running way ahead of schedule. We'll get another crop progress report from USDA later today, but look at this total from last week. Right now, 44% of the crop is planted. That's 18% ahead of the five-year average and 21% ahead of last year at this time. Leading the way right now, Louisiana, where 80% of the crop is in the ground. In fact, it's nearing completion in South Louisiana while just getting underway in northern parts of the state. As LSU Ag Center reporter Craig Gotro tells us, acreage is expected to increase this year. Young emerging rice plants are a common sight in South Louisiana. Farmers started planting in early March, and by mid-April, most of the crop was in the ground. Attention now turns toward North Louisiana, as farmers there have just begun planting. In South Louisiana, rice is really almost done. Uh, when we get to North Louisiana, it's been a little bit behind. They've caught some of those rains that we missed, so they're still trying to get started good. Levy expects to see an uptick in acres with much of the increase located in northeast Louisiana. We've seen a big uh, demand for seed uh, with potential increase in acres for this year. Uh, prices of corn have been down, so we've had a lot of people call about how do I plant rice that have never planted rice before. 
Demand for seed has led to a shortage of some varieties, which may put a ceiling on the increase of acres. We're probably going to be somewhere around 500,000, maybe a little bit more, so we'll see a slight increase from last year. Right now is the optimal window to plant rice in North Louisiana, which generally translates to a better crop. Usually we like to get those in mid to late April. Uh, they can actually go into a little bit into May, but typically we see better yields when we can get those planted mid to late April. Because of poor crawfish production, some fields were drained in March to get rice planted in April. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. All right, thanks Craig, and that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day out on the farm country.